and uh, it's a so abdominal distension was there, tender hepatomegaly was there, there's replication of tenderness as well, but there's no guarding or rigidity. And there's no spinomegaly as well. And there's a rash on the body, which is blanchable. So this is the rash uh, which was seen on the body. So with this uh, history and examination findings, what is our biosynthesis diagnosis we can keep? And what are the workup to be planned? Fever followed by a febrile fever of 24 hours with abdominal symptoms and rash. So, what are the DDs? Postbiotics. There are 60 slides, so if you don't answer fastly, we will be delayed. No one want to answer? Kirtana? Hema? So, Dengue is a new person, like a like, uh, rashes, fever, a fever, like a and could be even you can think eight year old share like fever, pain, vomiting. You can think of any appendicitis, but there is no pain in the right leg, also. But that could be a cause, okay? Any other details? The possibility of dengue is very high. Intestine is it, is it recovery rash or it is a, a leaky rash? The rash, what we are seeing in the picture, is a recovery rash or it's a leaky rash. Leaky rash. So it, it's towards the, uh, moving towards critical phase. So the rash in the recovery phase is different. It will be more like the extremities with a pink red color. And mostly it's a leaky rash. And what other DDs apart from dengue? Okay, dengue is accepted. Any other DDs you want to keep here? It could be any viral illness. It's not alone dengue. It could be any viral hemorrhagic fever, uh, any viral illness. Apart from that, the bacterial infections, what we can keep is, so one of the close DD is the scrub typhus. So the fever will be persistent. It, it really, it cannot, it can be seen, yeah, the kids see the one DD, but was in the chart. There's a close DD is. Apart from the routine fevers, you need to rule out. So viral is high likely etiology, dengue is the first thing. And apart from the record seal, and even your enteric is a possibility. So keep all the DDs in watch and plan the workup based on that. So this is the investigations I want to send. And someone can interpret the results. And what are your diagnosis? Chemo concentration is there, sir. Uh, Leukopenia, thrombocytopenia. Yes. Uh, thrombocytopenia is there. Transonasis is elevated. Good. Uh, dengue NS minus positive. So acute phase is positive, while IgM, IgV is negative. Okay. Rest other uh, negative, like uh, infective panel is negative. Sir. So what is you want to keep the DD now? DD Albumin on the lower side. Yeah. What is your diagnosis? The diagnosis. Acute viral illness with thrombocytopenia, sir. Okay. Why we cannot call it dengue right now? Because your dengue illness is positive. I don't mention it's a check, it's actually a uh, rapid test. Dengue and rapid test is positive. So, what is 
so uh, can we call it a confirm or dengue or uh, you have to call it as viral illness thrombocytopenia or viral hemorrhagic fever so we cannot call it as confirm or dengue right now so we need to call it as viral hemorrhagic fever but we can label it as probable dengue and we need to confirm it and what are the differentiating features of streptococcus from dengue which are close due to this uh, uh, what we encountered in this season so what are the uh, differentiating can we differentiate clinically streptococcus from dengue is it possible i mean streptococcus are we sometimes there could be an h car sir how many streptococcus will there be from rash will be there in dengue Yes. HR will be seen how many percentage of strep typhus? Ten, thirty, fifty, seventy. Four options. Thirty, sir. Yeah, it's only thirty percent. So if, if HR is there, highly likely it is strep typhus. Next. uh dengue the child will be a little flushed on looking we can appreciate like yeah. uh that morbidly rash will be there in dengue which is blanchable yes any other things i'll start with the history in any any differentiation when you want to do with two diseases you start with the history then the examination then investigations so this is the way you have to flow So, starting with the history, what are the things we can differentiate from history? Uh, if it's in dengue, there could be a viral illness, sir. So, prodromal syndrome, like any uh, cough, like in smaller children, there could be like prodromal illness, and biphasic fever will be there in dengue, and in strep typhus, there will be like continuous high grade fever which lasts more than five days. Yes, one is the continuous fever in strep typhus. Second thing is dengue. There will be a fever and FFP period where the child will worsen. Good. So what is about fever? Second thing, in examination something you are telling. Capital B filling time less than or equal to two seconds. Okay. What is thing about rash or cold? That is fine. Next, any other examination findings? Up down examination findings which can be differentiated from the first one being you. abdominal examination findings any abdominal findings if it is there it's highly towards typhus than dengue yeah when is pneumonia is the one thing so we'll move on so long duration of fever presentation is the most important factor which points towards strep typhus as you told it's hr and examination pneumonia is the most important thing dengue will have less than 5% spleen but in uh, your uh, strep typhus can have more than 50% and pneumonitis so it is the most important thing uh, which can differentiate strep typhus from dengue dengue we don't get pneumonitis in earlier disease only in the later stage you can get effusions or you can get pulmonary edema rather than pneumonitis and lymphadenopathy is a common finding in strep typhus and your investigation will show raised leukocyte count instead of leukopenia and your pc will be at normal range even in the when child is sick and in shock but in dengue and shock your pc will be very high And this important study done in uh, CMC Bellur about the differentiating features of dengue from strep typhus. So they had taken these parameters like SpO2, hemoglobin, total count, SGOT, bilirubin, alpha sensor, and total score. Among them, if you see the total count uh, will be high in uh, strep typhus and uh, it will be low in dengue. And SGOT will be very high in dengue and less in uh, strep typhus. So depending on the parameters, if you have less than 13 score, that will be the strep typhus. More than thirteen hours of dengue, so it is very important to differentiate dengue from strep typhus because the entire the treatment is different. So the strep typhus can be easily treatable with your doxy and azithromycin, and they recover dramatically. So dengue only support to management. So don't miss strep typhus uh, when you suspect dengue, and there will be co-infections as well. So keep an eye open for them. And regarding confirmation of dengue, if you have a uh, clinical picture associated with dengue, or you can have A rapid test positive for NS1 or IgM, we can label them as probable dengue. But to confirm dengue, we need all the following: any one of the following, like isolation of dengue virus, or demonstration of IgM antibody by ELISA, or NS1 by ELISA, or IgG zero conversion after two weeks. 
and we did it the viral nucleic acid by PCR. So these are the things which is needed for a control and dengue. So unless we confirm by these methods, you cannot uh, put the final diagnosis of dengue. So the government will not accept that thing. So please make sure that when you are confirming dengue, you have done all these investigations, not the RTTs. And the timing is most important. So you need to time the test accordingly. So less than five days illness, you need to uh, get the antigen test positive. And more than five days illness, you need to send for the IgM antibody. So this is the timing simple. PCR can be done at 10 .2, mostly in the early stages. Less than five. So what is the next line of management in this child? So does he want to give eye fluids for this child? And does he still need the antibiotics? And can we give plated FFP transmission because of thromocytopenia and iron of And what are things you want to monitor in this child? So these are the imp four important questions we need to ask ourselves uh, when you see this kind of children. So how many of you to think this cell is IU fluids? Chill, fever, poor oral intake, gastritis symptoms. You want to start or not don't want to start? If you want to start, how much you want to start? Half maintenance, full maintenance. 1.5 times maintenance. No one is managing dengue right now. Leave alone dengue. Any child admitted with these findings, what we will do normally? So some answered half maintenance, some answered 1.5 ml per kg per hour. Why 1.5 ml per kg per hour? The main problem in dengue is the capillary leak. So when we start capillary leak, uh, the body will try to compensate for the losses. So when blood is trying to compensate, just we need to give the enough fluid what is leaking out. But the body is not able to compensate and child is going to shock, then you have to manage the shock properly. So this child is not in the shock. So we need to just compensate what is the leaking. So because the child is here, vitals are stable, just we need to titrate the fluid according to the need for the body. We don't need to give more or no need to give less. If you give less, also a problem. So this child needs a maintenance fluid for the regular needs. Apart from that, you need to compensate for the leak. So we need to titrate the fluid based on the vitals. So we can safely start this chain in the maintenance, not less than maintenance. And based on the vitals, you can go up or down, depending on the what the chain needs. And second question is, does it need antibiotics? No, absolutely no. They use a viral uh, etiology, so we don't need to for antibiotics unless we have a suspected co-infection. And whether I give you platelet transfusion for this chain, platelets are 25,000 and uh, APT is 52. Can we start giving platelets and effect for this chair at this point? No, sir. Good. So the next question comes, what is the indications for platelets and FFP in dengue? When you want to give? There is any clinical signs of bleeding, sir. Yeah. There's many the signs of active bleeding, so we need to supplement it. So what is the first and uh, uh, foremost dead product you want to give when chair is having bleeding in dengue shock? You have blood RBCs, you have platelets, and you have FFP. Blood. Platelets, sir. Okay, it is the blood. Blood is the first and foremost thing you need to give. 
So don't wait for like other illnesses where you need to replace platelets and FFP for bleeding. But in dengue, the entire uh, pathophysia is different in bleeding. The bleeding is because of shock, not because of pyoglopathy. So if you start thinking of pyoglopathy and correcting only pyoglopathy, you will you'll, you'll not have the shock. And if shock is not corrected, the body will not able to maintain the hemostasis and the bleeding will not stop. So the first factor what you are going to give is PRBC or whole blood. So not platelets and FFP. And apart from the active bleeding, when you can give, so there's actually insufficient evidence that prophylactic platelet FFP transfusions will decrease the bleeding and decrease the mortality. So this evidence is very insufficient. And because of this transfusions, it can cause fluid overload. So to cut coagulopathy, we need large volumes of transfusion. So we cannot cut coagulopathy that much easily in dengue. So we need a lot of fluids which can cause fluid overload. And coming to indications, as you told, it's a massive bleeding or prolonged shock uh, with the bleeding not responding to red blood cell products. See, this is the most important thing you have to remember. When you have prolonged shock with bleeding, it is not responding to your RBC transfusions. Then only you have to move for platelet FFP transfusions. And if you're doing any sunscreen uh, procedure, sunscreen uh, catheterization, sunscreen catheterization, or arterial catheterization, so we need a transfusion to prevent the bleeding from that side. And as a part of massive transfusion protocol, so when you're giving for uh, PRBCs continuously for shock correction, this is bleeding, and uh, you have uh, crossed the uh, transfusion like a massive transfusion, then you need to give one is to one is to one ratio to replace the losses. And only uh, platelets can be given prophylactically when you have platelet for less than 10,000. This is from the national guidelines. Even some units will wait till 5,000 also. So this depends on unit policy, but the national guidelines refer to them. If you have less than 10,000 platelets, you can try prophylactic transition of platelets. Things to be monitored. One thing is to monitor vitals. In the vitals, the most important thing I want to be monitored is unit output. Whether you monitor heart rate, pulse volume, CRT, if BP is normal, the next vital, most important vital you have to monitor is unit output. The single most important vital which is to be monitored. And signs of fluid uh, overload, like respiratory distress and abdominal distension. And I will monitor investigations regularly, that is PCV, platelets, and the lactate for when you're uh, managing shock patient. And everyone has to follow the strict input output chart to see the, what is the balance and where we're heading towards fluid overload and how much is the output and how to try to get the fluids up or down. So what is the role of PCV? We, if you take a management of dengue, every dengue child will have at least five to six times PCV is done. PCV and platelets are the most common investigations to repeat in the dengue child. So why are you repeating PCV? So what so is the role for of PCV? Hemo concentration, sir. Okay, how is it going to help in management? So this child PCV is 47. So what, 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 what inference you got from this PCV? Child needs fluid, sir. Why? Because of capillary leak, intravascular volume loss. Okay. But child vitals are maintaining normally, right? And body is also already compensating for the uh, PCV, then why you want to give fluids? Here, this child, we started fluids because child is not taking orally. If the same child is taking orally, I will not give fluids for this child. So PCV alone will not give any inference for people. That's what I'm telling. Don't take PCV single value. The PCV has to be interpreted with clinical uh, status along with the serial monitoring. So single value of PCV alone have any value here. So you need to combine it with hemodynamic status of the child and you need to monitor serial PCVs. So as you told, it's, it's guide the rate of fluid and also type of fluid. The PCV will tell how much rate the fluid to be given along with the hemodynamic status and what type of fluid to be given. This is the most important thing. That's why you need to monitor PCV serially. So can anyone interpret these two scenarios? So one, child is in shock with high PCV. Second scenario is child is in shock with low PCV. Uh, child in shock with low PCV is that uh, some internal hemorrhage or something is happening, sir. Good. That's why PCV has dropped. Okay. So high PCV is capillary leak. So everyone knows this is the two common situations we are going to encounter in dengue shock. Uh, sir, one doubt. Why we are uh, doing lactate in this case? Like, 
easily plated okay plastic what implants you make i don't understand your question no like uh, investigations to be repeated every day along with pcv and platelets why we have to do lactate sir for this cell this cell not needed i i put it as a protein cell if any cell comes in shock we will monitor lactate so it's okay, okay. of the lactate cells no, not for this cell this okay, is okay so this cell uh, is interested is stable and pcv is in 47 so not in shock so we don't need worry much so we'll just give the maintenance period and see how the cell is moving ahead So these are two important slides uh, we need to uh, interpret. So high or increasing PCV. So cell is in shock. So it is a capillary leak. You need to give fluids. If the cell is stable, you don't need to increase the fluids. Even if the PCV is rising, if the vitals are stable, don't go up on the fluids. This is a commonest mistake. Uh, what we will do because we see in the rising trend of PCV, even though cell is very stable, active, we keep on increasing the fluid. So when his body is trying to compensate for that PCV and that leak, so we don't need to worry about that leak. So we need just to give, monitor the vitals. I'm telling not to monitor the vitals. Just leave the chain. No, you should monitor the vitals, and every hour you need to modify your fluid plan. At this hour the PCV is high, but chain is stable, so you watch the chain. Next hour the chain may because of leak, chain may decompensate as well. So then you need to give more fluids. So at that moment you don't need to increase the fluid rate. So don't anticipate the chain might go into shock. So next hour, so I will give fluids this hour. Now that is not the management in Dengue. So you cannot anticipate how the child is going to move, how the body is going to compensate. So try to manage the child as as and now where the child status is. So normal and low PCV, child is in shock. We are suspect hemorrhage, and you need to give for blood transfusion. And if the child is stable with normal or low PCV, you have to think the child is going to recover fast, and you have to tap on the fluids fast way. So this is the important thing we need to understand in managing the dengue. So combine PCV with hemodynamic status. PCV alone will not have any role. When you combine with the hemodynamic status only, you can manage the child. So these are four common scenarios you will face in any management of dengue child. And so these are two important things. Whether the classical teaching is the drop in PCV with good urine output is a welcome sign. The child is recovering. Then drop in PCV with a drop in urine output is indicates a bleeding. So you need to remember these two things. So what are the principles of fluid therapy in dengue? All we all know that IV rehydration is the single most important intervention that will save lives. But if you have to provide it timely and appropriate, and that there are two parts in fluid therapy. One is the initial fluid boluses to reverse the shock. Followed by titrated fluid volumes to match the ongoing losses. So not like septic shock, we keep on repeated fluid boluses. Here we'll just give a fluid bolus to make sure the shock is uh, uh, corrected. Shock is corrected means just you're maintaining the vitals at that moment. And from next hour onwards, we need to titrate the fluid volumes so to match the ongoing leaks. So how we'll know how much leak is going to happen by uh, monitoring the vitals. And this is the most important line we need, all need to remember in managing of dengue. That the main aim is here is you have to give the just enough intravenous fluid to restore the minimally acceptable circulating volume, not the normal circulating volume. So we all know the dengue will uh, uh, that uh, critical phase will be only for 48 hours, and when the 48 hours is over, the child will enter recovery phase. So once you give more fluids in critical phase, in the recovery phase they will end up in fluid overload, pulmonary edema. So that's why we should not overload the child in the critical phase by chasing the vitals. So we need to maintain the vitals uh, perfusion for vital organs, not for the skin and muscles. The main our aim is to perfuse the vital organs by minimal circulating volume, not the normal circulating volume. Never aim for the normal circulating volume. Just to maintain the minimal active circulating volume. So how you know the, uh, that vital organs are getting perfusion? Uh, that is only by monitoring urine output. If your kidney is able to make 0.5 ml per kg per hour of urine output, that means your all other vital organs are perfusing well. That is enough for them. If your uh, your kidney is not making urine output of 0.5 ml per kg per hour, that means your other organs also not getting perfusion. So we need to step up on the therapy. And second thing is you should avoid fluid overload. So this is the most important statement when you managing a dengue child. We need to remember this one. So don't over rush the fluids. Uh, to maintain the normal uh, uh, vitals. 
So our targets of fluid resuscitation is for classical teaching, uh, decreasing tachycardia, normal BP, normal pulse volume, warm and pink extremity, CRT three seconds. Especially this third statement is very tricky. We'll chase this statement and we'll run uh, behind this statement for giving more fluids. We'll uh, definitely land up in uh, fluid overload. So in my experience in the last seven to eight years, I never run behind pulse volume and uh, extremities. I even accept five seconds of CRT, low normal pulse volumes, and cold peripheries in a critical phase. If my BP is normal and my urine output is more than 0.5 ml per kg per hour, and my lactate is maintaining at the same range, not increasing. If a lactate is maintaining at the same range and urine output is more than 0.5 ml per kg per hour, that means your white light are perfusing well. But your skin and muscle is not perfusing well. I am not bothered about skin, muscles, and gut because I know in another couple of days, gel might recover and uh, he'll uh, fluid will restore back. So that's why you will not chase them back. So never aim for normal pulse volume, warm peripheries, and normal CRT. Just accept the borderline CRTs, borderline pulse volumes if your urine output is more than 0.5 and your lactate is not increasing. So this is the most important thing. I'm going to achieve decreasing tachycardia, not normal heart rate, decreasing tachycardia. I will achieve normal BP and stable consciousness. If I able to achieve these three things with urine output of more than 0.5 ml per kg per hour, I will stop the fluid there. Stop means I will not increase further. I will I'll just stop hold on the fluid there and gel is continue to be stable like that. I will come down on the fluid based on the PC. I hope I'm clear on this. People don't get confusion here. Just because it's a test group teaching is like we have to achieve everything normal. But if you're trying for everything normal, you can land up in a fluid overload. So my suggestion is not to achieve, go for full correction. You accept the low volume normal, like low normal pulses, whole peripheries and four to five seconds CRT. When you don't put this more than 0.5 ml per kg per hour. So this time we have started this gel and 3 ml per kg of fluid. And after two hours, this is this vitals. This heart rate is jumped, BP dropped. So pulse volumes are just like this. And you don't put this 0.4 ml per kg per hour. PCB was jumped from 47 to 50. So what is the current status now? Child is in shock, sir. What shock? Severity. When you have to tell shock, you have to tell the severity of shock. This is an eight-year-old child. Eight-year-old child. So what shock? Is compensated or hypotensive shock? Come on, this is basic. Eight, eight, like, what are they like? Uh, sister is 86, the child is having like 84. Okay, so it is? Exactly, it's a hypotensive shock. One, so one, according to Paul's guidelines, when your BP is less than uh, your target systolic BP, that is hypotension, it's hypotensive shock. Correct. So, except dengue, this holds good for any shock. But in dengue, the, because the pathophysical is entirely different, so the classification is slightly different. So even in uh, compensated shock, uh, they can be in having hypotension. So this is the adult target. So even in children, if they have SBP low also. So in dengue, we will uh, put them in compensated shock only. We won't label them as hypotensive shock. And the classification dengue is also compensated and the profound shock, not hypotensive shock. So in profound shock, you have signs of shock with undetectable BP. You have severe hypotension. So that's the main difference between compensated shock in dengue and the profound shock in dengue. So even with hypotension in dengue, we will label them as compensated shock. But if BP is very unrecordable, like very low BPs, then we will label them as profound shock. So this child is in which shock? Compensated the profound shock. So this child is in compensated shock. So how will you manage this child now? 
composite of shock come on how you manage any shock compensated so this is the algorithm uh, which is given by the who national guidelines so this child is in the compensated shock so we need to start this child on iv crystalloid so you can start at 10 ml per kg per hour and if you feel you want to go up also you can go so but my practice is to start only with 10 ml per kg per hour and if needed we can continue one more bolus next hour so this child we started on 10 ml per kg per hour ns bolus because he is in the compensated shock so this child received total 20 ml per kg ns for the next two hours so these are the vitals after two hours so you can see the dramatic improvement in bp pulses are like uh, better crt is improving peripheries becoming warm you know it is good pc is coming down so what do you want to do now you given two boluses and your vitals are improving and so what do you want to do now continue the same accept continue the same why you want to continue the same we have required urine output sir and uh, so vital organ perfusion is good so we can continue whatever we are on okay why you don't want to come down because already you given two boluses and your vitals are normal pcvs came down is there harm in coming down no i am asking is there, is there any, any harm in coming down so this is the most common uh, dilemma we will face as child is maintaining just no child improved whether i want to mess with the child so there is a commonest dilemma at some point of time everyone knows that we need to come down on the fluid so question yourself why not this hour you cannot keep on giving this 10 ml per kg per hour for next 48 hours at some point we know that we need to come down on the fluid so when you are watching the child closely try to come down every hour try to be if the, if the child vitals are maintaining persistently for 1 to 2 hours you know that i can come down so see like the, I, i am standing at the bed side so i am going to monitor this child so i will try to interview with the fluid don't play safe ball, safe games here it's not like safe games you are, you think it's safe but later on child can come uh, become a fluid overloader with pulmonary edema can land up on the ventilator also that will be unsafe for the child so right now your duty you can be it can be a playing safe game by maintaining child vitals but after 48 hours child can land up on the ventilator so don't think about safe uh, things i am doing safe for this child by not allowing the child to go into partial shock it's not like that so you need to keep titrating the fluid to match the leak If the leak is like 10 ml per kg per hour leak you need to give 10 ml per kg per hour if, if you feel that leak can leak may be improving you come down and see next hour if the vitals are maintaining that means you done correct if the vitals are not maintaining again you go back you go back to 10 ml per kg per hour again one to two hours then again come down watch improving continue and come down worsening go back so this is the way you have to manage the dengue chain not by keeping the 10 ml per kg per hour a number of hours so please make make a uh, point here that don't stand on the same fluid for 2 to 3 hours so you need to maintain and monitor and uh, modify your fluid regimen so don't stand on the single fluid single rate for a number of hours so the most important point i want to stress here so this child as child is improving and maintaining vitals well i will try to calm it down i will not stay there so this is the algorithm as well parallel is the same thing if you are have improvement with the crystalline improvement as yes. so you need to give 10 to 10 ml per kg per hour or 1 to 2 hours so i have already given 2 hours of crystalline for 10 ml per kg per hour so i will come down to 7 ml per kg per hour 
and if the child is still maintaining vital spherin nicely, I'll come down further. So uh, there is no harm in decreasing the fluid rate to seven ml per kg per hour in this situation, as the child is maintaining vitals and already given two hours of fluid bolus. So the, the same child, we drop the fluid to seven ml per kg and we give it for two hours. Then we drop it to five. A child is maintaining vitals very well. So we drop it to five to we drop it to five and give it for two hours. Then this is the vitals now. So your pulse volume is normal, BP is maintaining, peripheral is already become warm. Your output is uh, good, but your PCV went up from forty six to forty seven. So what do you want to do now? We can uh, still decrease the fluids sir, because urine output is adequate for perfusion is good. So three yeah. ml per kg. Very good. So this is what I needed. So don't see only PCV. So only PCV will not going to tell you anything. So take PCV along with the hemodynamic status. So here for the last four hours we are coming down on the fluid from seven to five and still child is maintaining hemodynamics. Maybe at five the child uh, the leak leak may be slightly higher, but the body is compensating well. When the body is compensating well, we no need to uh, increase the fluid rate. Here you can continue the same five or as you told, you can easily can come down. So here uh, it will tricky. Someone feels that yes, the leak is increasing. Whether I want to come down, I will watch for one more hour. Okay, fine. You can watch for one more hour or two hours. But definitely after two hours, if the still PC is high, increasing to 48 also, if vitals are maintaining stable, you need to come down on the fluid. I will going to make it 3 ml per kg despite the rising PCV. So you want safe, you can wait for another two hours. But if you if you are at the bedside, you are going to monitor this child, you can come down to three. That's what uh, my point here. So I can, I'll come down the fluid rate and I'll stop the fluid as further the child improves. The main fund I see is the body is compensating very well for ongoing plasma leak. So we don't need to give more fluids because we know on the 48 hours, child recover and uh, he will. Uh, take back the liquid fluid into the intravascular volume. Okay, till now we are seeing the improvement scenario. So we'll slightly change the scenario. So after initial 10 to ml per kg bolus, this is the vitals now. Your heart rate improved the fluid bolus, the BP is maintained in borderline, and your pulse volume is okay, low, low, still lower side, CRT is still five seconds, periphery are cold, you know, is still low, and your PCV is staying still there. So you're given 20 ml per kg bolus, and uh, so you uh, already have seen the vital. So what do you want to do now? Someone is raising the hands. Any questions? Uh, yes, sir. While decreasing from 5 ml to 3 ml, uh, yeah. Yeah. below weight 20 kgs, usually maintenance will come more than 3 ml, no, sir? Uh, yes. So for, suppose if it is 14 to 15 kg child, yes. 3 ml will come only 45 but maintenance will come to 52 ml. Yes. So which one do we prefer, sir, in that case? Definitely, I will prefer only ml. I will not bother about maintenance because I already given what is uh, more than maintenance for this child already. 10 ml okay. per kg fluid, 20 ml per kg fluid, 7 ml, 5 ml, like that. I already given okay. more than maintenance for the child. Okay. But it might not be the intravascular volume, it has leaked out. But okay. here we are not, not bothering about maintenance, we are bothering about vitals. If you okay. feel that the child is losing more fluid out, I leak and with the maintenance losses also. Okay. What will happen the next? If you're giving less fluid, what will happen to the rest of the child? Sorry, loss by maintenance, loss by leak, and you're giving less fluid, what will happen? I didn't get you, sir. Uh, not able to. Per kg per fluid, okay, sir. And child is losing by maintenance losses. The maintenance okay. losses is your skin, your respiratory, your urine. Okay. And, and your. Uh, then you causing leak. Okay. Sir. But you are giving only 3 ml per kg per hour. So if you feel child is losing more either by the maintenance losses or by the okay. losses, so okay. what will happen in the next hour? Then again the PCV will start increasing. So we need to hike the fluid. No, don't see the PCV and hike the fluid. That's what I'm telling. PCV and also along with that urine output and the stay, uh, exactly. vitals, uh, everything exactly. we've seen. Sir. Just to concentrate okay. on urine output. PCV and urine output. Okay. If you don't just drop it again, that fluid is 0.6 ml per kg per hour. I make the fluid 3 ml per kg per hour. 
Okay, sir. Next hour, I got only 0.3 ml per kg per hour. Okay. But vitals are stable. Vitals are stable, okay. but you need to drop it. So what I have to do now? Then again, then we need to hide the fluids because yeah, so you do not have per kg per hour. That's okay. all. Okay, sir. Okay. So like that, you need to titrate. Don't okay. stand at a single fluid. That's what I'm telling. Don't stand at a single fluid. Every hour, you need to titrate the fluid up and down. Okay. So no, while while titrating only after five ml, when we want to come to three, we need not see whether three is more or maintenance is more for that child. Oh, we can directly right. come down to three. That's definitely. Right. Definitely. Okay. Okay. Sir. Because Thank you are going to closely monitor this child. Definitely, you can. Okay. 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 Sir. Thank you. So this child, what I have to do now? So this child is still in the shock. Compensated shock and you know, still less. We already given 20 ml per kg NS. And what do you want to do now? Come on. Someone answered albumin. Well, it's good. So when you tried uh, crystallites and you not got that much response, the next thing what we can try is collides. So this is the algorithm. So where you are standing now? We are standing here. So we are given crystallite for two hours and there's no much improvement. We have to check the PCV and PCV is still in the high range. So your PCV is 50. So we are going to give colloid for this shape. So I'll start 10 ml per kg per hour colloid bonus for this shape. So coming to colloids, what is the role of colloids in dengue? And how many types of colloids we all know? Is there any disadvantages for colloids and give colloids? What are the things you have to monitor? And among the, all the colloids are the best colloids. Usually normal fluids that will be leaks. Colloids like uh, the molecules will be larger. So there won't be leak through the intravascular volume. Like capillary leak won't be there. That's where we can give colloids. You are partly correct. Your point is correctly valid. So you are telling that colloids have large molecules. They so will not leak. No, that is wrong. But you are partly correct. The rate of leak will be less. Even with albumin, they leak. Your, your damage to the intima layer is very extensive that even the albumin will leak. So don't think that colloids will not leak. If that like that, there will be a dramatic improvement in colloids and all the guidelines will change to start colloids at the first instance itself. And there will be a huge change in mortality difference. So, but all the studies will tell there is no change in mortality difference in colloids. The reason is that they will leak less, but if they leak, they will drag the fluid along with them. So colloids are osmotic agents, so they will drag the fluid and they will cause compartment syndromes. They will stay there in the third spaces. They will not come back also. So whatever colloids leaked out, they will have more time to come back to the intravascular volume. So in that way, they can cause more problems for you also. So that's why I think that uh, colloids are not that safe uh, when you are trying to treat in dengue. So crystallites, you know, they leak rapidly. So you need to give you more fluids. Colloids, they leak slowly, but if they leak more, they can cause more problems as well. So you need to balance. So the balance is very important here. So the one important factor in using colloids is they theoretically they work on the shock more quickly because you are giving more oncotic uh, fluid. So they can uh, increase the shock, correct the shock rapidly. And by preventing the more leak, so they can decrease the fluid overload risk. So the, what is the need? You can decrease the your fluid volumes, giving fluid volumes, and they for if you say high, profound hypotension, so you can try to give colloid rather than crystalline because they can restore the BP urgently, uh, rapidly. So that's all. That's the only advantage of colloids, but they are not going to change any of the hospital stay terms or mortality. There's no clear advantage in terms of mortality and hospital stay. So they can decrease the fluid need, they can correct the shock rapidly and if your BP is very low, you can try colloids. This is the only uh, thing they can do in the uh, fluid management, but they will not change your uh, hospital course and mortality. That is the disadvantage. So you have natural colloids like human albumin and artificial colloids like gelatin, dextral and starch. So these are different molecules available in the market. So, uh, depending on the disadvantages and advantages, we'll try to choose what is uh, our uh, need in the dengue. So, you have star 6%, 10%, uh, volumen, uh, and the yellow fusion, is kind of gelatin and dextrons, 
and your 5% alumin and 20% alumin 20% alumin we don't use in dengue uh, in critical phase remember that in any shock it's a uh, 5% alumin is a choice and when you're treating for hypo albuminism like nephrotic syndromes you need to give 20% uh, alumin so not in the dengue okay. but the biggest disadvantages are they can impair your coagulation already you know in dengue they have coagulation problem so this uh, dextrans and uh, this uh, starch can impair your coagulation further and your gelatin will have allergic reactions and they can damage the osmotic uh, uh, renal injury they can cause osmotic renal injury and the most important thing is they can leak the, they can they can once they leak they can cause compartment issues so be careful when you're giving uh, colloids as well they're not that safe as you think and this upper limit for uh, starch and dextrans your upper limit for starch is 50 ml per kg and dextrans is 30 ml per kg we cannot go beyond this so this one limitation for this sir uh, it can be overcome by your gelatins gelatin there is no upper limit you can go uh, up, uh, how much you can you can give and there is no upper limit on 5% albuminols so this is the most important thing i think you have to remember this point and these are the disadvantages everything will affect the coagulation except your gelatin and gelatin has the highest allergy pot potential and dextrans will cause renal failure in hypovolemic patients so my choice when your patient is offered above the choice is 5% albumin and next is choice is gelatin next is starch and last is dextra so this is what my choice is and uh, I, I, you can consult others also what is their, their own preferences so my preference is patient is all uh, offered above i will try to resist the chain with more of 5% albumin and gelatin uh, i till now i not used starch and dextra i completely avoid them because i have safer alternative of gelatin so this is the status of the child after 20 ml per kg colloid bolus so we have seen the improvement in the vitals you know put is improved pc is drop out so what we want to do next so you given uh, like say gelatin i given gelatin uh, for 2 hours and this is the vitals right now and what i want to do next <laughs> Can we change to tonight, sir? Can we change to? Can I turn mute, sir? Yeah. Can we change to? Crystal light. Crystal light, sir. Yeah. Very good one. Any other answer? Someone is answering whole blood. I know. I know why you want to blue blood. at this moment any reason for giving whole blood at this at this moment as chel is improving no when vitals are stable even pc is dropping you should not think when pc is dropping vitals are improving that means chel is improving your vitals are dropping and pc is dropping then only to think of gd uh, Here the vitals are dramatically improving. The heart rate came down, BP improved. The urine output from 0.3 improved to 0.8. The CRT is coming down and PC is coming down. Means that means you are you are compensating the leak well with your fluids. So there is no point of giving blood in this situation. You may be correct when your urine output is still 0.3 ml per kg per hour and PC is 45. You may try by giving blood. But when urine output is more than 0.5 and your PC is coming down, that means the chain is improving when chain is improving you need to change your management so you can rightly say you can change the crystalloid or you can come down on the colloid as well so so this is the guidelines so what you can do is when chain is improved you can come down to colloid of 7 ml per kg per hour you can give it for 1 to 2 hours and then can switch out to crystalloid so like this as you can do or you can straight away switch out from 10 ml per kg to 10 ml per kg per hour crystalloid either way if you are right there's no harm from changing from 10 also but to be safe you can come down to 7 and colloid and change to 10 and uh, 7 and crystalloid so that is way we can do and you can come down uh, like previous scenario you can come down which is stable but our hospital we won't do this we won't follow this protocol so we will try to continue uh, colloid with crystalloid combination uh, say if you are giving 7 ml per kg per of fluid So what i will do is i will put 4 ml per kg per hour crystalloid and 3 ml per kg per hour gelatin that is colloid 
so that i'm i'm, I'm sh uh, making sure that I, I can cut down the fluid rate and if i you can question me like that so when you're doing combination why you cannot give only gelatin why you want to give add in combination crystallite the answer is already i told the collides also can leak out if i'm giving only collide they can cause later compartment symptoms so i will try to balance it whether i want to give 3 ml per kg per hour collide with 4 ml per kg per crystallite mm -hmm. or vice versa 4 collide and 3 crystallite based on my vitals i start with 3 ml per kg per hour collide and 4 ml per kg per hour crystallite next hour my unit is dropping so what i will do i will i will not increase the rate i will change the combination i will change the collide to 4 and crystallite to 3 then i will try if the child is maintaining vitals i will hold it there and after one to two hours i will cut down like 0 0.5 0 0.5 i will cut down so 3.5 collide 2.5 crystallite or 3 collide 3 crystallite so you can try various combinations depending on your patient status but you need to try modifying something don't sit on the same thing the most important thing is you keep on modifying your fluid regimen one to two hours stay stable come down and becoming unstable your is decreasing go back modify your therapy come down now uh, your is dropping go back come down go back come down go back so you don't know when this chain is going to improve whether the chain is going to improve in next 12 hours or 24 hours or 48 hours till that time you have to try your fluid uh, rates you have to modify fluid rates don't sit on the same fluid rate for at least more than four hours if you're okay, sitting on the fluid rate for more than four hours means you're not doing a good job so you need to try coming down going back coming down going back but make sure that you are at the bedside you're monitoring the chain if you're not monitoring the chain how much fluid that you are going to give, chain is going to worsen or chain can land up in the fluid over. If you think that I am going to go home, so I don't want to take the risk, so I keep continuing 7 hours per kg per hour because chain is maintaining well. But tomorrow morning you come back and see chain limp and ventilator. So that way fluid is a double edged spot. If you don't give fluid, chain can worsen. If you give more fluid, chain can worsen in other way. So try to make a family uh, policy that you are at the bedside titrating the fluid. The most important intervention, what to be done for a dengue child is the doctor sitting at the bedside and modifying the fluid rate. That is the most important thing that can save the number of lives. So that is the previous scenario. So the, here also child improves, so we come down on the fluid. And this is the other alternate scenario where we given 20 ml per kg of colloid bolus. So also we given crystallite for two hours. Then we switched over to collide for two hours. And for that, after two hours, child had abdominal pain and distension. And these are the vitals now. There's a drop in BP, uh, you don't put it still low. And there's a dramatic fall in your PCB. So what is the interpretation? What do you want to do next year? We have to move, we, our, our time is moving up. Think of internal bleeding, sir. Exactly, very good. So you have unstable vitals. With a drop in PCV, so we the next thing you have to think is internal bleeding. So what do you want to do now? Fresh blood, sir. Fresh blood. So don't think that PCV is 40. That means hemoglobin is 13. All shock guidelines tells that the target of HB is 10. Here the patient is maintaining 13. Why I want to do blood? This is the calmest mistake we'll do in our practice of managing dengue. So never think like that. The PCV is 40 is at the background of hemoconcentration. If you properly adjusted the hemoconcentration, the PCV can drop to 30, 28 also. So you don't want to that extent to do the collides and by the time chain will worsen and chain will not recover also. So if you, you had to catch the chain in this point itself. So if the PCV is dropping with unstable vitals. Don't let the chain sink further. Arrange for a fresh blood and transfers as early as possible. I hope I'm clear on this. So don't think of seeing PCV of 40 and someone is asking blood transmission, why, why they're giving blood transmission for PCV of 40? Is this nonsense or is this a uh, waste? So I have seen many of my seniors told me the same thing. PCV is 40, you should not transfer. It's not like that. So PCV is 40 is a background of hemoconcentration and vitals are unstable. Dropping of PCV from 50 to 40 is a very unwelcome sign. So you need to go for blood transmission in this scenario. These are the guidelines. You can see here there is no improvement after you are 
colloid bolus. So you check the PCV. If PCV is decreased, that means you suspect occult bleed or over bleed. Here over bleed is not there, so it's occult bleed. So you need to go for urgent blood transfusion. But if it's not suspecting or occult bleed also, so what made we suspect occult bleed here? This point, abdominal pain and distension. So any child with severe abdominal pain, which is worsening with a fluid resuscitation, think of internal abdominal bleeding. So because pain can be there from admission, but if it is worsening with fluid resuscitation, that means it is bleed. Think of that with dropping PCV. So that may be think of occult over bleed, uh, occult bleed here. So I need to go for blood transfusion here. So I can try 10 ml per kg whole blood or 5 ml per kg PRBC for one hour. And I had to prefer uh, fresh blood less than five days. Don't give transfusion of PRBC over four hours. So that is a wrong concept. So many of us we still be doing that thing, but we need to modify that thing. So here we resistant shock. Shock, whatever fluid you give. It is like a bolus. It is not like regular transfusions. Here you need to give, if you have whole blood, give it over 10 ml per kg per hour. Or if you have PRBC, give it over 5 ml per kg per hour. Then you recess again. After one hour, you recess. What is the PCV? What is the hemodynamics? If PCV is still low, you can continue blood further. If PCV is increased and your uh, uh, shock is still there, you can switch over to colloid. If child is improved and uh, your PCV is improving, you can switch over to colloid as well. So, what is the reason for fresh blood? Why you need only fresh blood here, not the old blood? Can anyone answer why we need only fresh blood in dengue shock? Okay, we'll move on. What is the indication of bleeding? If you have significant overt bleeding, definitely you have to give blood transfusion. Also, when you suspect concealed bleeding, how to suspect? There's a drop in HCT without any clinical improvement. This is the most important scenario we're going to face. So if you don't have any other investigation, ABGS we don't have, just to follow this. There's no clinical improvement or much improvement. And PCV is falling, suspect bleeding and due to transfusion. And you have severe metabolic acidosis and uh, rising lactate, despite your fluid replacement. Think of bleeding. Then also you need to give the transfusion. And rate, I already told, it is not like four hours, you need to give rapidly. And the reason for fresh blood is, in the whole blood, there is a deficiency of 2,3 DPC. If it is deficient, your oxyhemoglobin curve will shift to left, and it will not leave the oxygen to go to tissues, and it will cause phosphate to few hypoxia. So that's why we need to try to get the fresh blood, not the whole blood. If you give whole blood, then the child cannot improve. So because you are not delivering oxygen to the tissues. So make a habit that in dengue transfusion, you have to get the fresh blood at least less than five days. So, these are the vitals after 10 ml per kg PR basic transfer over two hours. The vitals are improved, the renal output is improved, the PC is improved. What do you have to do next? Faster. What do you want to do next? Given 10 ml per kg PR basic, child improved. What do you want to do next? You want to continue blood or you want to switch over to something? Switch over to crystallized Yeah, it can be, but the guidelines say switch over to colloid. So see here, you have improvement. Yes, you need to go for colloid. You give colloid for one hour, don't shift directly to crystallite. What they're recommending is from that, you have an intermediate of colloid. If colloid and colloid are improving, then switch over to crystallite, like the previous scenario. This is the only difference in the guidelines. So blood, crist colloid, followed by crystallite. So for the next four hours, child hemoglobin got better. We went into 5 ml per kg per hour. But now child developed tachypnea. And there's increasing effusions. But child was maintaining saturation of room milk. So these are the vitals of this child. So output better, PC is decreasing, pulse volume becoming normal, CRT is becoming normal, peripheries are warm. But child developed tachypnea. And there's effusions. And still we are on 5 ml per kg per hour fluid. So with this scenario, how many of you want to try classics? So we are waiting the child to 5 ml per kg per hour and currently child developed tachypnea and effusions. Your vitals are very well. So here, anyone want to try classics to decrease distress? If yes, 
what is the founder? Anyone want to try Elastix? Come on, it should be interactive. You have to move on. Say yes or no. You want to try or no? Don't want to try. Someone answered no. Why? No, sir. Why you why don't want to try? You want the child to learn up on ventilator? Child is developing tachypnea, efficiency are increasing. So you want to put the child on NIV or ventilator by giving uh, by, by, by don't starting LASIX. If you answer this question, you have understood this answer very well. Yeah, someone has answered. Should you should drop the fluid first, not the LASIX. Hundred percent proof. So don't worry about respiratory status. You can save the child by putting the child on NIV or ventilator or oxygen. But if you make the child drop in the vitals again, this time child may not improve also. So this child in shock improving nicely and by giving LASIX, if you cause further intravascular volume status low, child can go back into shock again. So you are worrying about respiratory, but what I am worried more is cardiovascular here. So if you maintain cardiovascular, you can support respiratory by, you want to try NIV, you want to put an ventilator, that's fine. But if you till the balance, if you till the hemodynamics again, we are giving LASIX, you may not even get the child out of the shock again next time. So don't think that we need to do LASIX at this point of view. The main aim here is you need to drop the fluid first. Still 5 ml per kg is very high. So you need to come down on the fluids. Then you want to try LASIX when the child is stable on the very minimal fluid for quite some time. So my policy is try to wean the fluid is a minimal of 1 ml per kg per hour. Then even on 1 ml per kg per hour, the child is maintaining hemodynamics very well and your PC is not much increasing at a minimum of 6 to 12 hours. If you want to be very safe, keep it 12 hours. But if you don't have any facility for NIV or ventilation, you can at least maintain a target of six hours. That is your, your uh, uh, hospital scenario. So my hospital, I have a very facility for NAV and uh, ventilator. So I can safely wait for 12 hours if the PCV is maintaining there, not increasing much. And hemodynamics is maintaining very well on the 1 ml per kg per hour. And I will start LASIX only after that. And I don't want to give LASIX bolus. I am going to start only LASIX infusion at a very minimal rate. 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 mg per kg per hour. That is what I am going to start. Never try to give LASIX bolus because we don't know what is the sensitivity of that child for the LASIX. One child can pass only 100 ml, one child can pass 500 ml, one child can pass 1 liter. If the child can pass 1 liter with 1 mg per kg LASIX, you are out. You are going to crash the child and you are going to restart the child again. The entire last 6 hours, 8 hours of management, you are going to restart again. So that's why never try LASIX bolus. You can give slow infusion starting at 0 0.05, 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 mg per kg per hour and see the response. You know, it is improving, but it's maintaining. You can go, you can step and increase 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 till you get the desired negative balance by watching the vitals closely. But if you give a bolus of LASIX, you cannot titrate the vitals. You cannot uh, make the vitals in your control. So don't try to give bolus dose of LASIX in dengue. That is what my suggestion here. And so we try out the fluids we are minimal. We start on LASIX infusion. Next 21st, we achieve negative balance and we efficient decure and child improved. We shifted child to what? So this is how we able to manage this cell out of the shock. Any doubts still now? Anyone want to comment here? The management? If no doubts, I'll move on. So scenario two, where we get the late referrals. If the child came very early like this, we can easily salvage the child. But if the child come late, what are the complications we are going to encounter? So we have seen a 12 year old obese child, produced fever for two days, abdominal pain, degree of intake, admitted in local hospital for 24 hours, managed as dengue, NSN positive, had severe thrombocytopenia, given transfusion, status IV fluids. Finally, child developed worsening respiratory distress and altered sensorium. So for this reason, 
So he was referred to our hospital. So you have seen a classical dengue uh, with thrombocytopenia, malarial fluids and transfusions, worsening distress and altered sensorium. This is what Chain uh, was referred to us. At ER, Chain was maintainable. You can see tachypnea, SPO2 is 86%, ADNT was decreased, marked retractions. Heart rate was high, BP is very low, pulses are 3D, CRT is prolonged 6 seconds, peripheral is cold, sensory was 9 by 15, pupils are reacting, RBC, uh, GRBC is low, and abdomen is grossly distant and tense, and this is a diffuse tenderness over the abdomen. So, this is the status child referred to us. So, what is your physiological status and how we will manage this child next? So what is the physiological status of this child? False, false physiological status. Come on, come on. The profound shock, respiratory wise. Okay, sorry. Respiratory wise, child is in. Child is in recovery phase. There is a fluid shift. Child is in with IV fluid shift. Respiratory distress has uh, increased the uh, respiratory distress like, that has worsened respiratory distress. Um, and second thing, the child is having altered sensoria. Yeah, yeah. See the vital center. So not we should think of this not recorded. This child is having profound shock with respiratory failure. That is what our uh, physical stress are this movement. So, what are the cause of respiratory failure in dengue? So it could be your effusions causing compart uh, compartment syndromes, like intra-abdominal uh, ascites causing compartment syndrome, pleural effusions, or fluid overload causing pulmonary edema, or your uh, dengue myocarditis causing pulmonary edema. These are the main cause for respiratory failure in dengue. Think of this when you have uh, this child. I'm going to manage a clearing situation because altered sensor is there. I'll supplement O2 and I will go for early NIV because child is having significant distress uh, because profound shock. I'm going to view 20 ml per kg and as bolus by push and pull. As hypoglycemia is there, I'm going to view dextrose. A child has an altered sensorium. It could be due to shock also, but I don't want to take a risk. It could be dengue encephalopathy also. So I will try to manage the child and neuro uh, protective measures. I view 3% NS bolus as well. And I'll send the investigations. So with these measures, SA were to improve to 95 and we given another bolus also for this child. So what do you want to do next? So these are the investigations. So, uh, we have seen uh, uh, total, total plecopenia, low platelets, your PCB is 40, significant elevated liver enzymes, significant derangement coagulopathy, NSN is positive, others are negative, CRP is 6.7, severe metabolic acidosis, lactate was 13, ferritin was high. So what is your interpretation with these results? So this is a classic, classical case of dengue. And uh, what is the, your interpretation of PCB? Tell in shock with PCB is 40. What is the interpretation? Profound shock with PCB 40. Profound shock with PCB 40, what do you want to do now? Blood. Yeah, good. So this is a state of bleeding. Any internal hemorrhage. And child is in acute liver failure as well. The G what is prognostic derangement. INR was more than two point three. So we can give vitamin K as well here and repeat the INR again. So now we will move on to what are the causes of excess fluid overload? Because everyone is thinking this is recovery phase because of over resuscitation, but it's not recovery phase. This child is in the critical phase only because child is unstable vitals. Only when you think recovery phase, when child is in stable vitals. So one thing is excess on two rapid IV fluids in the initial phases. And incorrect use of hypotonic crystallites. So uh, apart from the NS and DNS in the infants, you cannot use other fluids. Half DNS is strictly prohibited in dengue management. You can, you can try RL, but even RL is hypotonic, a little bit hypotonic side. 134 is the your, uh, sodium. So I still prefer NS and DNS rather than RL and no half DNS. And inappropriate usage of large volumes of IV fluids without recognizing severe bleeding. This is the calmest mistake we'll do. This is what should have happened in the referral hospital. 
so they might not be uh, thinking of uh, internal bleeding and they should have given more fluids thinking of shock and they should have fluid become fluid overloaded without correcting the shock that's why i'm going to stress this point again 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 think of internal bleeding at the earliest when your pcv is still dropping not not below like 30 28 even in the 40 45 range your vitals are not improving and pcv is dropping think of occult bleeding and give the blood don't delay the blood if you delay the blood you are going to land up in refractory shock and inappropriate transfer of components so you think of bleeding and you are not giving prbc you give other things frp platelets and you can land up in fluid overload and you are not stopping the fluid you are continue same fluid for number of hours so this is the common thing is the fluid overload and other conditions like your ischemic heart disease congenital heart disease and sepsis and you have lung problems these are the other more comorbid conditions which can cause fluid overload so think of all of them when you have child with fluid overload so after one hour child is still worsening distress increasing we decided to ventilate so what are the precautions we have taken for this child before in ventilating so this is a physiological unstable situation physiological difficult airway so what do you want to do now here so there is a shock there is a metabolic acidosis there is a severe distress so we have three condition hypoxia shock and acidosis so what do you want to do now when intubating this child precautions correct yeah thoda by ka step by step yeah so first thing is respiratory wise you have preoxygenate and you can give um like bag and mask ventilation matching the rate with the patient rate and sedate them and paralyze and give the fluid bolus and you can even try low dose vasopressor to maintain the bp in this child and bicarb bolus so these are the things we need to do when you are ventilating this child so child successful intubator these are the settings your pp kept at 9 if at 100% but your pip is very high 57 and child has still unstable hemodynamics abdominal girth is increased child started bleeding this is the x ray uh, so these are the vitals so high ventilator settings these are the x ray abdominal girth is increasing child is bleeding from nose and mouth this is the calmness scenario when you encode a child in late phase and his still vitals are like this little better but you know but still 0.3 and pcv is still 38 So what are the problems now? What do you want to do now? There could be like high ventilator settings. You should think of any pulmonary hemorrhage also in this scenario. Sir. Correct. You can think of. Okay. But there's no ED bleeds. Child is bleeding only from nose and mouth. So we can give like transitions like PRBC platelet FFP back to back. Good. You can give. Exactly. Next. What is the most important thing? Which, which, which is the most important things which can stop bleeding in dengue? Apart from your PRBC transfusion and correcting the shock and other other blood component transfusion, what is the most important thing you have to do? How many transfusion you do? Without these things, you cannot stop bleeding. <coughs> Use your common sense. If if if, if any child is bleeding from nose, what are you going to do? I get the bleeding from skin. What you're going to do? Sudden, like we can come compression. So you need to go for local local measures. Someone raise your hand. Please ask question. Rama Anjan, any any question? No, sir. No, sir. Yeah. Okay. So. exactly so you need to go for local measures apart from your systemic measures you need to go for local measures this child the so problem should be still persistent shock active bleeding very high ventilator pressures acute liver failure so management i'm going to do is for shock management i'm not i'm going to give emergency prbc and volvet transfusion i'm going to do nasal packing for the active bleeding i can try platelet and ffp transfusion also and the most important thing is Anti fibrinolytics. Majority of people will forget this. Keep on transfusing. Try right? tranexamic acid, ethamsalate, like this. Some things also they have shown so improvement. Vitamin K also you can try. Definitely they can work. 
But the most important thing is correct the shock by PRBC transfusion and do the nasal packing. And for liver failure, you can try endostyle system apart from the liver measures. So can we give fusamide because of your lung is very bad, your high pressures? Can we give it now to decrease the lung pressures? Yes or no? No, sir. no, even no. if child is going to die, I'm not going to do lasix in this situation because anyway, child is going to die because of shock. So, measures to control bleeding the most important measure to control bleeding is not platelets and FFP, it is blood, blood, blood. Don't forget of transfusion, PRBC transfusion, volbate transfusion. Never give FFP transfusion, platelet transfusion before PRBC transfusion. The first priority is PRBC, not platelets and FFP. So I'm stressing this again and again because I'm going to see the same scenario and people will jump on new platelet before uh, PRBC transmission. That's not going to help. So don't forget local measures. Don't allow the chain bleed. You can compress, it can stop bleeding even in coagulopathy. And avoid ng 2 This is the most common reason for bleeding in dengue chain post intubation is someone will try ng 2 insertion. So they will get lost bleeding local trauma and can try tranexamic. These are the things we can use. So this is the simple ones. Uh, this is the some uh, molecules where they can drag the water, they can enlarge. So just insert the, this, this is the initial one. You can insert into the nose like this and with the low, low, local moisture, they can swell up like this and they can compress the tissue. It is easily available. It's a needle cell or even on packs. It's, a, it's easily available in the market. You can try this. And for the posterior nasal packing, this is the only anti-nasal packing. The posterior nasal packing, we can insert the foliar bulb. You can put the foliar bulb like this. You can inflate the foliar with the saline and the posterior nasal pharyngeal wall and put, do the anterior packing with the eulon patches. So you can compress the posterior wall, the posterior plexus and anterior wall, little plex, uh, this, uh, plexus. So both plexus will be compressed. So this is the chain. What we done it is the packing we'll do. The foliar will be hanging there. And we do the anti nasal packing like this. So, it will, I'm telling it will help. It will dramatically stop the bleeding. It will, you can see rapid rise in hemoglobin as well. So, try this. Uh, try this local measures to stop bleeding. So, with the above measures, bleeding is controlled, and, but shock is not getting corrected and it's worsening. Now, the PCV is 45. SQ is falling. Even on ventilator, high safety, your SQ is falling. Yeah. So, sorry, when will we remove posterior nasal packing? So how can we know Which one? whether it is by posterior, posterior nasal packing by four inspector or by setting four inspector inflammation? When we will remove sir, that? When we anything, remove, anything, how anything once you feel like the chair PCB is maintaining very well and your hmm. myoglopathy is reasonably corrected and the chair is out of shock, mainly okay. 24 hours. We will at least 24 hours and after 24 hours, we can see. Okay, sir. Thank you. So what do you want to do next? S4 is falling, PCB is okay. We, we have improved PCB by giving blood transfusion, but shock is still not corrected. Abdomen is getting tense and what to do next? So this is a scenario of refractory shock. We have done everything, we corrected everything, but still is still refractory shock. So what are the cause of refractory shock? The most important thing is your inadequate plasma replacement, inadequate replacement of leak. And second thing is occult bleeding. So here we are at at this. We have given fluids, we have given blood, but still we are not improving. So we need to look for A, B, C, H, S. A is abdominal compartment syndrome. B is, can anyone, if you know this, you, you understand dengue very well. One more A is also there. Abdominal compartment syndrome, one more A. Come on, this, this can be seen in any shock. Any refractory shock will suspect all these things. Acidosis. Yeah, good. Acidosis, acidosis, sir. B. Uncontrolled bleeding. So C is cardiac dysfunction. It could be due to sepsis or it could be my dengue myocarditis. And most importantly, you are metabolic things. Hypocalcemia, hypothermia and hypoglycemia. Don't forget these things. Uh, please think about any shock, any not only dengue, any shock, 
hypothermia is the most important one which can worsen the shock rapidly and it can worsen the acidosis it, it is a vicious cycle hypothermia acidosis and shock is a vicious cycle if you don't correct hypothermia your acidosis and shock will not get corrected so think of all these things and last thing is sepsis hospital acquired sepsis is the most common entity which can cause worsening shock so think of all these things so in this chain you need to think of all these things so we started the channel hfov because spo2 is low we started on hfov next option we have hfov and suspecting abdominal compartment syndrome as abdomen is very tense we have done paracentesis and we removed 300 ml of fluid when you remove 300 ml of fluid your vitals can go unstable so keep the boluses ready start the bolus and, and do the tapping so here we give crystalline uh, colloid boluses and this hypocalcemia we corrected it and we did echo echo revealed lv dysfunction so it is a dengue myocarditis so we started channel adrenaline so with this measure shock improved ventral septic decreased bleeding control abdomen became soft gradually we decreased the fluids we not put improved after 24 hours we are thinking that chain is out of critical phase and we start the fusamide infusion and we remove excess fluid sensor was normalized and extruded chain of 48 hours so this is the scenario if we, we can manage the chain like this chain can come out even after this much bleeding and refractory shock so never lose hope in dengue they can recover if you if you modify your uh, management according to the chain need definitely chain will recover if the chain present little early not in very refractory shock where chain already landed up in vasoplegic shock we cannot make the chain come back from there so try to refer the chain early when you are not able to manage the shock that's the main funda here so coming to the role of vasopressor in order to treat dengue so your vasopressor can increase the bp but will not improve the perfusion so there are waste unless you have internal uh, intravascular volume your vasopressors will not going to help much in dengue so try to improve intravascular volume so the paradox is again worsen tissue hypoxia and in this lactic acidosis so if your heart rate is increasing along with the bp that means your vasopressors are not working and uh, don't try them and uh, give more fluid and indications is is a temporary measure like intubation during intubation we will anticipate fall in bp so we can try starting us at that point of time and if we have cardiogenic shock due to myocarditis you can do even ischemia profound hypotension can cause myocardial stunning there also you can try adrenaline and you have agonic septic shock you can try vasopressor the canaradilin and in refractory shock not responding to fluid and blood this is late presented so you can try vasopressors but before starting vasopressors you have to make sure that you have filled the tank fully if you are an under filled tank your vasopressor will not work if tank is empty it will not work so you need to fill the tank first so coming to abdominal compartment syndrome you can read it abdominal compartment pressure more than 20 is the abdominal compartment because of massive ascites in a pretty short time they can easily land up in abdominal compartment syndrome if you feel a tense abdomen your fingers are not insinuating well try to tap the abdomen they can worsen the shock they will not improve so how to tap it you can uh, do a controlled tap you can put a cannula kind of iv set and you can control the drainage the initial rate is 4 to 6 ml per kg initially followed by 2 to 3 ml per kg for one hour so this is the controlled rate so don't drain fastly if you drain fastly chain can become worsen the shock and worsen and chain can bleed inside also so these are two important things you need to remember don't drain the abdominal fluid rapidly at the go so control only for 6 ml per kg initially followed by 2 to 3 ml per kg next hour so this is the way we can check the uh, bladder pressure so we will measure the bladder pressure by connecting it to the uh, transducer if it is anything more than 12 so we need to try to tap it so even abdomen is not tense we, we, we won't wait till the abdomen become tense we will just connect the bladder to the uh, abp transducer arterial bp transducer we will connect it to the arterial bp transducer we will measure the bladder pressure this is the foley's catheter we will connect this thing if anything more than 12 bladder pressure we need to tap the ascites control only we have to tap and this is the technique we'll follow we'll put a cannula a pink or gray uh, green cannula we connect a three vein iv set and we can control it once the we got the fluid down we'll close this once you close this we can control the uh, drainage so you can try it is easier so you can put a cannula this is an arterial catheter even you can try central line catheter central venous catheter you can put into the abdomen that will be more easier and more uh, less uh, traumatic for the patient 
So these are the techniques you can use for controlling uh, control parasynthesis. So this child uh, improved, but after four days, child had fever spikes again. Initially, there's no fever for two days, and after four days of epipenile period, child had fever spikes, and child had again uh, shock. But this time, child uh, pulses are bounding. It's not like uh, hypovolemic. Uh, it's bounding pulses. Peripheries are warm, and this hepatosplenum. Initially, there's no splenomegaly. No child had splenomegaly. So what are the duties now? Four days epipenile. And again, new onset fever spikes and uh, distribute to shock and with a uh, splenomegaly, new onset splenomegaly. Come on, ladies. Yeah, one thing is HLX. Second thing is in the hospital, worsening later. Hospital, 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 Co-infection, hospital level infection, HLH. So these are the investigations that you do. So I have done the PCV is less, HB is 8.8, all other, initially plate cone improved to 80,000, and again it's dropped from 80, dropped to 23,000. Your CRP is high. Your engines came down to 12, uh, hundreds and it, again they went back. I checked with dengue, uh, malaria, scriptivus again because of co-infection. Now this IgM is positive, it's confirmed with dengue only. No other infection is there. And now I did the ferritin. Ferritin was 86,000. So fibrosin was low, triglycerides are high. So blood culture came sterile. So now what is your diagnosis? So we have three DDs. We've done the workup. And this is the workup. HLH. HLH. Exactly. So this is HLH. So when to suspect HLH, any persistence of fever beyond seven days or recurrence of fever, Elevating transamines, initial, initial elevation is because of shock. Once you control shock, it will normalize. But again, this elevation, then you have to think of HLH. Progressive cytopenias, new organ dysfunction, any AKA or ALF, hepatosplenomegaly. Initially, it's no hepatosplenomegaly, now splenomegaly is there. Hepatomegaly is common in dengue, but splenomegaly is very rare. And not responding to the conventional management of dengue. So think of HLH. So this is the criteria. Fever, splenomegaly, cytopenias, hypofibrogenemia, hypertriglyceridemia, uh, hyperferritinemia, and bone marrow showing hemophagocytes. So this child satisfies the criteria of HLS, so we are going to treat this child. The treatment is steroids and intravenous immunoglobulin. So not like classical HLS, this is secondary HLS, so no need to start ketoposide. So we can straight away start steroids, if you want to start Dexel, you can start or with so These are the doses. You need to give for five days and they have to step up slowly. And IVAG, two gram per kg, you can give for over five days or two days. That is your choice. So these are the first line therapy, corticosteroids and intravenous immunoglobulin. Refractory, you have to start etoposite. So that child improved with this treatment and sent home. So last scenario, so this is the scenario. Six-year-old child, four days fever, two days no fever, body pains, admitted to local hospital, given IV fluids, Dengue was positive, PCV was 45 initial, and stable hemodynamics throughout the stay. And now the child's referred because worsening distress. Mm -hmm. No point of time, child had unstable hemodynamics. He was very stable throughout the stay. And a given IV fluids, and the PCV was initially 45. Now, child was having respiratory distress. So now, child was referred to us. This is the situation. Heart rate was like normal side. BP is normal, CRT is okay, pulse volume normal, chill is needing oxygen, unit put is good, but PCV is 33. From 45 PCV, your PCV is 33. Bilateral effusions are there, no bleeding. So what is the phase now we are treating? Critical phase or recovery phase? So where are we now? Recovery phase. Exactly. Vitals are stable. That is drop in PCV is recovery phase. Vitals unstable, dropping PCV is critical phase and it's bleeding. Just remember this point. So what do you want to do now? Classic start classic. First you stop fluids, start diuretics. Okay. Give the respiratory support as needed. So this is the common scenarios we'll face in dengue management. I hope I am clear on the scenarios. So we'll move on to the next take-home messages. So don't neglect dengue, thinking of only COVID. 
So by assessment and investigations, we can easily differentiate acute febrile illness into the diagnosis. And co-infections are common. Try to figure out whether you are dealing with a co-infection when you are already diagnosed with one infection. And fluid therapy is the only therapy which can save a dengue child. No other therapy, no other inotrope is not going to save any dengue child. You can add them up. If the child has myocarditis or sepsis, you can add them up. But if you don't give fluid appropriately, it can kill the child. If you give more fluid, if you give less fluid, it can kill the child. So you have to give fluid timely and appropriately. And you have to modify the fluid accordingly. Colloids and crystalloids, you have to titrate depending on your need. And think of occult bleeding. If you have persistent shock, especially in the setting of drop in PCV, think of occult bleeding. Don't wait for the PCV to drop below 30. And telling that I need to transfer only blood when HB is 10, less than 10. So that is not a scenario ending you. So even if PCV is falling to 40, from 40, if it's falling to 40 and shock is persistent, think of occult bleeding and give blood transfusion. And actually look for compartment syndrome. This is the most important thing we'll forget. We'll keep on giving blood transfusions, PR basic, uh, fluids and uh, inotros, but we'll forget abdominal compartment syndrome. Even with little tense societies, they can have abdominal compartment syndrome. Don't wait for that very tense abdomen. If the child is very, abdomen is very tense. That means you have missed the, uh, uh, at least four to five hours of uh, uh, abdominal compartment syndrome. So try non-invasive ventilation in preference to invasive ventilation because you can invasive ventilation can decrease the preload on the heart. So first to try priority is non-invasive ventilation. And reserve the parent FAP transfusion for sick children, significant bleeding, even after PRBC transfusion. The first priority is PRBC, not the FFP or platelets. And try to give local measures of control bleeding. Don't uh, keep only focus on the blood transfusions. And don't attempt NG to be in dengue children. So dengue can prevent very easily. It can prevent a sense of light. It's an expanded dengue syndrome. Go and read about expanded dengue syndrome. So there are a number of presentations, pancreatitis, encephalitis. So keep an eye open for it. So the last slide, early identification of shock, appropriate and timely fluid therapy, an appropriate uh, type of fluid is more important. And early referral, if you're not able to manage the child, will save a lot of children. Thank you. So you can ask doubts. I hope I'm very clear on dengue management. Any doubts or we can conclude the session? For maintenance fluid, we have to put only NS or DNS in both rooms. That depends on your child status. If a bigger child, no ALF, even you can try NS. But if you are very worrying that child might land up in uh, hypoglycemia, you can do DNS, but if I give him very high rates, like 10 ml per kg per hour of fluid, I will never try DNS. I can put half okay. NS and uh, half as a DNS, like that. So the most important is to monitor the RBS. The, the, uh, I forget to tell, if your RBS is very high because of your DNS, it can cause false elevation of urine output. Child is in shock, but because of hyperglycemia, your urine output will be high. So you think a child is out of shock. So that's a false uh, thing. Never forget to check RBS when your input is improving. So shock child, input is improving. Think about uh, check out GRBS, especially when your shock is not improving also. Vitals are unstable, input is improving. Think of hyperglycemia as well. Your choice. You want to give half as NS, half as DNS, that's your choice. But in fact, I will try to give more of DNS rather than NS. I will go for DNS because they will end up in hypoglycemia easily. Okay. And ALF okay. No role for steroids in dengue shock. Only in dengue HLS you can give steroids. Do never try steroids in dengue shock because it can cause any uh, gastric bleeds, gastritis and bleeds. So we have to try only in uh, HLS only. Any doubts? You can you can you can ask in the group also. WhatsApp group also. Any doubts? Uh, I will conclude this meeting.